This is Karen, and I'm here with Aaron Marikami at his studio, actually his big warehouse where he does all his innovations, which are amazing. And I'm doing an issue relative to Lakovsky, and that got me going into the whole idea of why are these people lost to history. So I look behind you at your sign that says Vero Science, and it says Revival, the Science of Electricity. So something got you excited about creating mm -hmm. the MW, and you have a story because it wasn't a straight line. Mm -hmm. So why don't you give us a little clue on how you got started with this? So the Lakovsky MWO is kind of the, well, it's the grandfather of all these type, this category of high voltage, high frequency uh, machines. And this was invented in the early 1900s by George Lakovsky. And I've known about it for a long time and probably some of the first material I saw probably 20 years ago or something was from uh, Borderlands um, Research Science Foundation that Peter Lindemann, Eric Dollard, and uh, a bunch of others were uh, a part of. And they did a lot of experiments and kind of what eMedia Press does today with, um, you know, a lot of the experiments and the projects and the collaborations and putting out the videos and, and everything. Borderlands was kind of the pioneer in that doing these videos with Peter Lindemann, Eric Dollard, and uh, Michael Knox, and um, some of these other people. And it was a multi-wave oscillator handbook mm. uh, published by Borderlands. Um, I think Tom Brown was kind of maybe the main author of it, kind of giving their idea about the MWO, what it's all about. There were even some videos that came out about it. And back in those days, uh, you know, Peter Lindemann, uh, Eric Dollard came on later, and you know, everybody kind of had their own idea about the MWO. My understanding is that Bob Beck, who is somebody who actually funded uh, Eric Dollard way back, a lot of people in the alternative science, alternative health and all this, know the name of Bob Beck with his, you know, uh, blood electrifiers and, and he was into all kinds of stuff. And I think he even possibly manufactured his own version of a so-called multi-wave oscillator, Lukowski MWO. So. If it wasn't for Bob Beck, a lot of the conversation and knowledge about the MWO today probably wouldn't be around if it wasn't for his efforts and, and kind of putting that forward. And um, there's some interesting connections with the MWO and the Integratron near Landers, California, where Eric Dollard was the last uh, engineer who worked on the Integratron before it was gutted and turned into some kind of worship temple. And that was basically De designed and developed by somebody named George Van Tassel and it was supposed to be a rejuvenation device that could almost teleport you or something you know there's all this strange stuff and you know and he had and a he, little UFO tech in there there's a there was downloads and different kinds of things well he, he claimed I, I think that uh, the ETs gave him the information on this on the Integratron right and I think Van Tassel knew about the MWO, and the MWO was actually one of Van Tassel's inspirations, to my understanding, on developing the Integratron. So with my, you know, 12 years relationship with Eric Dollard and having worked on the Integratron and everything, this was something that, um, you know, about six to maybe, maybe seven years ago when we started making these, Eric Dollard is the one who designed the pulse modulator, which is basically the control box that you know creates all the magic that gets sent to the coils and the antennas and everything because he had a background with borderlands and, and a, his own kind of way of looking at it back then and this was before anybody really knew what the MWO was so when Bob Beck is talking about the MWO and you have all these other companies one in uh, the Netherlands one in New Zealand a couple here in the States where people are building these smaller so-called MWOs in these little cases and everything and they're powered by an ignition coil and some of them just have one antenna even if they have two um, they're basically these you know balanced units which I'll get into later um, and the Lakovsky MWO is an unbalanced unit intentionally and I'll, I'll give the whole breakdown on that in a, in a, in a bit but um, it's all based on speculation and there was one particular patent that Lakovsky had that showed, you know, one antenna and it had a basic little circuit with the, you know, high voltage transformer and a spark gap and stuff. And people are looking at this thinking this is what Lakovsky was doing. Well, about, this is maybe 10 years ago, something like that. Um, okay, so let me go back. 
12 to thir maybe about 13 years ago or something like that, there was a couple of Italian engineers who I mentioned on uh, the Vril website. You know, and Vril is, you know, one old term for basically like life force energy. And, I, and on Vril.io, there's about us, and you can see where the concept of the Vril came from and why that's being used as a term for, you know, uh, chi, ki, prana, breath of life, the ether, all these kind of, you know, related concepts. So these Italian engineers um, came in contact with a couple, you know, some of these crated up Lakovsky MWO units that have been crated up for decades, maybe 50 years or more or whatever. And they were the production models, and I think the brand name was Colisa or something, like C-O-L-Y-S-A. It's been mm -hmm. a while since I've seen that. And those were the production models that Lakovsky had manufactured. And there was like three different models, I think like a BV-1, a BV-2, and a BV-3. Uh, they all basically performed the same, but each one had maybe bigger rings or smaller rings. They operated in a different carrier wave frequency. I, I just want to say we make no claims for these. These are just research and test devices of historical importance so people can understand what Lakovsky was actually doing. Because this, th this model is only one of two in the world being manufactured, 100% elect electrically correct um, compared to what Lakovsky was actually doing. So what these Italian engineers did uh, was they basically analyzed these old original production units. And until that moment, thir 12, 13 years ago or whatever, nobody actually knew what Lakovsky did. And it was all speculation and a lot of speculation based on this one patent and the diagram in there of what people thought Lakovsky was doing. And they never knew of these certain features, which I'll go into in a bit, that makes it a uh, multi-wave oscillator and why it's completely different from all these so-called, these balanced units that everybody's making, which actually has nothing, no resemblance to what Lakovsky was actually doing. So they reverse engineered it. They looked at the waveforms, all the specs, the winding count, the whole nine yards, you know, up one end and down the other, every little detail. And then they published this in a uh, report, uh, Secrets of the Multiwave Oscillator, I don't know, whatever it happens to be. So um, the first person to manufacture an authentic MWO based on the real design for the first time ever since Lakovsky's death was um, uh, a friend in Croatia named Zvonimir Rudomino. He uh, went by Lighty, L-I-G-H-T-Y, in energetic form years ago. Brilliant engineer over there. He built a lot of the models in the Tesla Museum over in that part of the world. Uh, got an extensive background. He helped me out a lot back in 2008 in a lot of these um, little experiments I was doing with this spectrum analyzer and all this. Uh, Tektronix company loaned me a $15,000 scope that had all this capability for doing certain experiments and he walked me through a lot of these over video calls and stuff. And so he, he knows what he's doing. He, his units are um, electrically the same as these, but they're in this you know, beautiful big heavy cabinet that you know, like a practitioner would stand behind and do the knobs while somebody is sitting in the chair and built in the spirit of the original early 1900s model. And so it's really a museum piece. And um, after him, there was somebody in Michigan or Iowa, somewhere in that part, and I can't even remember his name. He was an older gentleman who was making uh, an MWO based on that same reverse engineering report. So it was electrically correct. Um, but there was a couple of parts, like the end caps on the coils were 3D printed, and you know they were kind of like leaning over on their stands and stuff, and it was kind of flimsy and not the best quality, but it was accurately built. However, um, a lady in California had one of these units, and so this guy was the second person to make an authentic MWO based on the reverse engineering specs, and he was making maybe one a month, one every other month, or something like that, and kind of a side, you know, kind of business for him. And um, there's a lady in California who got one to Peter Lindemann. So Peter Lindemann had one of these, and he was using it, and then after a while he, oh, and when he turned it on, like his cell phone, or the, the mobile phones would turn off, and it would create all this, you know, uh, interfere with the Wi-Fi and all this kind of stuff, opened it up and found out that the high-frequency line filter, which is part of the AC circuit from electricity from the wall 
goes through here and then it goes through a line filter to prevent like this high frequency business from going back into the wall because you don't want to have high frequency this radio frequency stuff going backwards through the power cable into your outlet because you'll put noise in in your you know b back in the electrical wiring so there's these filters that stop all these emissions from getting back into your wall well the line filter was misplaced it wasn't hooked up right so peter fixed that and, and it took care of the problem so Peter used it for a while, and then he took it over to uh, Flyback Energy, which was Paul. Let's, let's just stop for one second, because some people don't know. You put on a conference, mm -hmm. and you worked with Bedini for a while, and through that you've met yeah. these certain these certain gentlemen. So you're going to explain who Linderman is and Babcock is, and and why mm -hmm. it is that they're so foundational mm -hmm. to you and your network, and yeah. why and what it is that they you know because okay. you work together as a team lots of ways, and you you collaborated. Okay. So you might want to just explain a little of that okay um yeah and then i'll get back to the uh yeah. <clears throat> peter taking mwo to paul's company yeah. years ago so uh so these people how, how i met how i met them and and how they're you know were cr critical to this whole network right mm -hmm. and um so well first of all in the mid 90s 94 95 that's when the internet first started um I was on my own quest, more of a spiritual quest, seeking answers, you know, seeking knowledge for the sake of knowledge itself. And I was on a quest for free energy, but I never heard that term from anybody. I thought I came up with that term. So I started searching online, saw a whole bunch of nonsense that was obviously nonsense. But at that time, I didn't know a resistor from a diode or anything. I knew kind of what a resistor was. I could probably build a flashlight circuit. That's probably about it. But I didn't know anything about, um, electronics I knew how to make a little coil and hook it to the battery and you know turn it into an electromagnet but that was that was it you're doing better than me <laughs> so, <clears throat> well there was this one website I kept going to over and over that had these little um, like motor energizer designs and schematics and stuff and it was there was no big wild claims or anything it had some pictures and schematics and a couple little descriptions and stuff but it was something about that site that kind of captivated me, even though I didn't understand the schematics. Uh, but all of it looked too complicated for me to do anything with. You know, I'd see a schematic with three or four components on it. And it's like, I don't know how to build that. And, um, you know, but I did like to go to the Radio Shack back, you know, when he still existed, you know, here in Five Mile in Spokane, not, not far from uh, my parents' home when I was living there um, at that time, you know, to get little things for experiments and whatever. And so I saw there was this whole free energy thing, and um, you know I had these bicycle wheels with curtain rods on them, where I taped these speaker magnets in it, and I was trying to get one to repel the other and get the wheels to turn on their own and whatever. Of course, it didn't work. Um, but um, then I just gave the whole thing up because I'm like, okay, I don't know know what to do. I don't I, I don't know how to qualify anything online as being nonsense or if it's legit or whatever gave up on it. So in 1997 or so, um, I was introduced through some wild synchronicities to Roger Estes, who is um, who's recognized by the Chinese Qigong delegation in Beijing as being the first non-Chinese certified natural born Qigong master. And he had the stigmata bleeding from, at St. John's Cathedral on the South Hill years ago on Good Friday. This was probably 40 something years ago, probably when I was like in elementary school or something. When I met him, he was in his early 60s. And he never knew there were healing abilities associated with it or whatever, but he was an inventor himself, invented all kinds of stuff. He invented the net play pins for children, these fail safe pull pins on fire extinguishers of a certain plastic resin that, you know, if you got a metal pin and you squeeze the handle on a fire extinguisher, you can bend the pin and you can't get it out. Right? So it was this plastic composite that was strong enough where you couldn't accidentally pull it, but if your adrenaline's pumping and you squeezed it, it would cut it clean so you could still use it. Uh, you know, the, the countertops with embossed with all those colors and designs and all that kind of stuff, like kitchen countertops and whatever, he invented the process to, to do those and he licensed it to the Masonite Corporation years ago. So on and on and on, medical devices, I mean, you name it. And, um, so he was the first person I'd really consider a mentor in just, you know, simple business sense, you know, why, why spend money on a big brand new building when you can just build these things in your garage. And that was in reference to one of these medical devices that I have over here.
So we started getting interested in manufacturing red and infrared pulsed LED light devices. This was 25 years ago, like in a 1999, 98, 99. And then his good friend, Dr. Charles McGee, who is, um, he's basically known as the first alternative OBGYN in the United States. He was one of the pioneers of orthomolecular medicine. Roger and Dr. McGee both were good friends with Linus Pauling, Ewan Cameron, who's, who went into a lot of the vitamin C and cancer studies and all this. And so, but also they were friends with Dr. Marvin Kane, the, the, basically the, the, the horse doctor who worked on a lot of Kentucky Derby winners and he was an alternative holistic type vet. And he was the first one to use um, pulsed LEDs uh, on animals and the first one was patented and made in 1981. So my genesis of my school of thought in a lot of this goes back to, you know, two people away from Linus Pauling, two people away from the man, Danny Paris, who patented the uh, LED device in 1981. This is, you know, that's 40 years ago. And you used to run 43 a, years ago. A vitamin store? I used to own a vitamin store. So we were looking for an electronics um, company or somebody that can manufacture these red light devices for us and through some mutual attorney friends they got connected to somebody in um, Post Falls Coeur d'Alene area out on Celtis Way and Roger went out there with Dr. McGee and he came back and Roger said yeah this guy has this had this motor and he, he spun it up and it charged it kept his own batteries charged up I was like no way I was like I gotta meet him I didn't have to hear anymore. I was like, I got to meet him. So the next day he drove me out to Post Falls and this is when John Bedini had a shop at the end of Celtis Way. And the electronics business was booming at that time. He's doing his CD clarifiers, which makes CDs sound crisper, um, can make DVD quality look sharper, uh, his audio amplifiers and preamps and all this kind of stuff. And so uh, the business was thriving in 1999 at, at that time with all that stuff. So Roger took me there, went in, met John Bedini, met Gary Bedini, and we went back to where John's desk was. And there was a, a desk and a video monitor, and next to him he had this um, filing cabinet with this glass case around this little motor. And um, I actually have a replica that Peter made sitting on the bench over there that he presented on a few years back at the Kootenai County Fairgrounds. But this glass case motor, it was the first thing John showed me. So he lifted off the case, um, started with dead batteries, turned the rotor, it spun, the light started blinking, and after about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, it was going faster and faster and faster. Not like super ultra high RPM, but fast enough where you could see it was speeding up. And this computer monitor, it was, you know, one of the old cathode ray tube heavy monitors sitting over there with whatever on the screen, and with each rotation, doof, 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 that magnetic pulse was so strong, this, the image on the screen would shift like this with each rotation. I'm looking at this thinking, where do I learn more about this? Mm. So he asked me if I was on the internet, and I was like, yeah. So he wrote down his website. I went home, got on the internet, and the website I went, went to was the same one I went to over and over and over uh, four years before, and a person who owns a website out of anywhere in the world lives an hour from my home. So that was my introdu introduction to John Bedini, and he gave me uh, an open invitation to come out anytime I want to talk about whatever, and you know, visit the company and see whatever I wanted to see. And uh, all those years, I, I never had to sign an NDA or anything. And he became a good friend and you know, mentor for 18 years. You know, not that a lot that he had to offer that I could comprehend or understand because I didn't have a background in a lot of it. But I learned enough and soaked up quite a bit over the years with you know what I could and of course I learned more and more over over time and you know got my frame of reference you know kind of dialed in and everything so John Bedini is you know one of the godfathers of the so-called modern day free energy movement he's a world famous um, audio engineer you know his holographic sound system processors known as BASE B-A-S-E Bedini Audio Spatial Environment has been used by everybody from Aerosmith Leonard Skinner Janet Jackson you name it you look at all the names of all these you know famous musicians where in their um, studios they had these base units processing their sound and stuff and even Hollywood movies Halloween 4 with all these trippy sound effects and stuff Hunt for Red October 
with Sean Connery, you hear these sonar sounds, bing, you know, and it sounds like so alive and, you know, and, and, and real, Hunt for Red October and all these kind of stuff. So he's pretty prolific and a lot of people don't know that about him, but his equipment was used by like everybody. He did something kind of unique with the, the uh, Bedini schoolgirl. It was his way of getting things out that maybe not would have been allowed. Yeah, so right or, not too far bef before I met John, at the end of his building where I first met him was somebody else that worked there who had a daughter named Shawnee Bauman that was at 10 years old, was getting in the science fair at her elementary school. And I guess, her, you know, her and her dad or whatever went over and talking to John and John gave her the schematic to the basic little, you know, energizer. And he called it the schoolgirl energizer because of her. To basically poke fun at engineers because if a little scroll girl can make this work and do it, what's wrong with everybody else? Because there's a lot of people who just couldn't even get it to run. And I don't understand how they couldn't because it really is pretty simple. But she won the science fair. It ran for days. Uh, the battery didn't really deplete. And then at the end of the fair, I think somebody stole the batteries. Gene Manning wrote an article on this mm -hmm. in either Atlantis Rising or Nexus or I don't know, one of these magazines and it was about Shawnee Bauman and that schoolgirl motor. Yeah. That article, I guess in a way, kind of went viral at that time. And that was kind of launched a revolution of people being interested in free energy because a lot of people never understood those concepts or whatever. But that was something tangible that the average tinkerer who had basic rudimentary skills could even build one of these and start experimenting. And whether or not they got the results that they wanted or not, they could at least get it to work. And it inspired thousands of people around the world. It's probably the number one most replicated circuit by experimenters who are interested in anything in this field. So, you know. Let me ask a question with mm -hmm. that, because that takes us back in a way to the, the multi-wave oscillator. Because we're talking about energy, we're talking about what it does. So Lukowski was very curious, and then we'll go back to Linderman a bit back mm -hmm. just for a second, just to tie in mm -hmm. the energy component, because there's a fundamental reason he created it. There were some issues relative to what health, and he did some experiments, starting, I believe, with plants, and he discovered something. So I'll let you go ahead and, and give us a little clue. And so again, you know, we make no health claims or anything for, for this. The, you know, these are research test devices for enthusiasts interested in high voltage, high frequency type of apparatus. But I just want to make one thing clear. Mm -hmm. He did take tumors off plants and he did have success with people. So I know you're not making any claims, mm -hmm. but he had some substantial um, good results from what he did. And there was a reason for it, which goes back to the energy and what's mm -hmm. in the field, in the ether. So... so Lukowski was studying different disease clusters in Europe and I think one of the common denominators that he found was the places that had some of the poorest health and health problems had poor soil conductivity. Okay, so between the earth and the ionosphere, you got, I don't know, ballpark 300,000 volts of potential difference between there. It's like a capacitor, right? You got the negative plate here and you got the positive plate here and in between you have a 300,000 volts of electrostatic potential and um, you know so you have X amount of volts per meter if you have a thunderstorm or something it could be way cranked up right okay so the electrostatic potential from the ionosphere to the earth if it doesn't have a good place to ground then life suffers life he, suffers in those areas and he talked about different soil types had more conductivity than other, and where there was not enough conductivity, people were not well. Yes. So, so and that, that gives validity to grounding or earthing, right? So like this is an earthing mat, but I don't even need to use the strap yeah. that grounds, right? This, con, this, conduct, this uh, concentrates the conductivity, you know, um, o over its area, even though we're on concrete, it's not very conductive, but at high voltage and high frequencies, concrete's, you know, very conductive, it just, kind of skittles over to the, the top, it's not an issue. But with grounding, so if somebody has an earth mat, you know, people talk about, oh yeah, you're in contact with the earth and you're discharging, you know, whatever kind of positive charge is building up and whatever, and there's even shoes, you know, that, that can ground you and stuff. And, you know, with little copper tabs under the bottom in contact with your bare feet and, and sandals and stuff like that. So you're, as you're walking, you're still in contact with the earth. 
it feels good when you're barefoot on grass. You know, you're in the soil. You stick your hands in the soil. You just feel something. You know, there's that. There's you can't really explain it, but you just know the difference. And so when people are have earth mats, whether it's on their bed, they put the clip on and then they put it like in a uh, uh, ground prong on their outlet or under a work desk or whatever it happens to be. You're not just doing those things. You're also making a good conductive ground for the electrostatic potential from the ionosphere. So you're making a good pathway from the ionosphere through you to that earth mat because that, that's a good ground, right? For him, it had to do with the cosmic rays as well. Which it, yeah, I mean, well, what, however he wants to define those. Yeah. But um, instead of getting too, too esoteric or whatever, th there is that electrostatic potential. And these, in a way, are an attempt to replicate that earth ionospheric connection at high frequency, way higher voltages, and with an earthing component that everybody else is missing out on because they got these balanced units where this has one of the phases grounded, which we'll get to later on, on why it's important to have this unbalanced unit and where it is contacting uh, an actual earth rod. And, and it's best not to use the ground prong and outlets because there's too much dirty electricity and the ground is not a clean ground anymore. You want to take your earth mats and ground it to a dedicated rod in the earth directly uh, away from the electrical system. Okay, so we were basically understanding that what he's trying to magnify is, is nature's essence. So when our cells get out of balance, because mm -hmm. a lot had to do with balance and the fact that we're in a lot of places that are not balanced or not charged. So he's with his machine, he's compensating and bringing your body back into balance. How does that happen? So with the electrostatic potential, it's so what happens between these antenna is a displacement current. Displacement current is what's between two capacitor plates. Conventionally, they're going to say, oh, yeah, you got electrons piling on one of the plates. And this is where you're getting this potential difference from. But that doesn't happen. Um, you're basically, from my viewpoint, is you're basically storing electrostatic potential, which is basically polarized ether, which is like a gas. And you're storing it at a certain pressure, polarized in between the plates. Dollard would call it dielectricity. But this dielectric medium, basically the, this etheric medium, is what's being stored between the plates, polarized and at a certain uh, pressure. That pressure is going to be equated with voltage. Between this antenna and this antenna, if this one fires this way or this fires this way, because it oscillates back and forth, is that this is electrostatic potential, which means there's no electron current. This is electron-free electricity is what's happening here. Now, you you got regular electron current happening in the box and the transformers and these magnetizing losses and all this kind of business. But essentially what's being happening here is a longitude, so-called longitudinal form of electricity. So a transverse wave is an electromagnetic wave. A transverse wave travels like, like this. So if you and I had a rope and we pulled it, and if I took one end and I went like this, mm. the wave will go down the rope, but the amplitude will diminish by the square of the distance, right? It gets weaker and weaker and weaker. It's like this attenuation factor, if that's what you want to call it. you got a radio station, you're driving in your car, you're out on the highway, and the further and further you get from it, um, the signal will get weaker and weaker and weaker eventually, right? So these are electromagnetic waves, transverse waves, but as you have the wave going like this, like on the rope, like this, energy is, you're, you're dissipating it 90 degrees, to the direction that it's traveling. So you have a loss at 90 degrees. It's traveling that way, but you got this going like this, right? So you're losing potential, you're, you're dissipating potential in this direction when it's moving in that direction. That's why it gets less and less and less. So longitudinal uh, propagation, if we, you took the rope and I took the rope and we tugged it really tight, if I just tugged like this, instantaneously it's the other end, but there's no loss 90 degrees, right? Right. Okay, so that's longitudinal. Now they're going to say, oh, well, you can't tr transmit electricity longitudinally. But you can. You know, a tidal wave is longitudinal. It goes in one direction, but there's no waves, there's no loss in this direction. It actually gains energy as it's going, one directional. But you look at the water rippling on top of the ocean, that's transverse. You got this loss, right? But underneath, you got this thing, this massive swell that's getting bigger and bigger, and it's going in one direction 
but you're not losing energy 90 degrees to where it's going. It's actually building as it's going. So those are the longitudinal. You're going to hear the term scalar waves, right? People talk about a lot of these different types of devices and all this. No, oh, scalar waves this and scalar waves that. Scalar is something with a magnitude, like a strength, but there's no particular direction. So how can there be a wave if, if there's no direction it's traveling? A scalar is, okay, in the shop right now, it might be, I don't know, say 70 degrees Fahrenheit. 70 degrees is a magnitude, right? That's, that's a magnitude for the temperature. But what direction is it traveling? It's not. It's omnipresent all the way around us. That's a scalar. What's the barometric pressure? Well, it's whatever it happens to be. It's not moving in any particular direction. We're sitting in this omnipresent um, barometric pressure. That's also a scalar. When you're sitting in between voltage potential, that's a, you could say that that's a scalar. But it's not a wave traveling from one place to another. So, so you're sitting in a field, in a field effect. I, I guess you can say that. Okay. You know, I, I don't know if that would completely be the proper, but that conveys the idea that you're basically sitting inside of an electrostatic potential where the space, the ether between here and here, is polarized, but it's also at a certain pressure. Um, now, these transverse versus electrostatic um, potential, uh, this uh, longitudinal propagation versus transverse, is a transverse waves, if these were electromagnetic waves, you know, with electron current and all that moving, to go from one antenna to the next, it takes time to get there, right? Because um, it's traveling a distance, right? Traveling a distance. Um, that would be a transverse wave. Electrostatic potential, when it's emitted from here, it's instantaneously here. Technically, there's no velocity to it because it does not take time to go from here to here. It's instantly polarized. And we can demonstrate that with your rod when we turn it on in a bit. Well, right? you can demonstrate that there's a certain voltage yeah. available, right? But... Um, you can't really see the, the transmission itself. Okay. Okay. So. But you the, can see with the rod that the it's lit up across the field, across. It would be across your trash. You could see it with the, with the. Oh yeah, you can rod. see that. There's yeah. that that potential absolutely yeah. is there. Yeah. So you know a transverse wave takes time to get there with loss, mm -hmm. right? Because it's going over a distance. Um, the, this type of propagation, I guess you could say, is extraluminal, which is the terminology that you know Dollard uses, and he has a whole presentation on the extraluminal transmission you know, of electricity, which is that it's outside of light speed constraints. It's not governed by that whole Einsteinian paradigm, which is completely wrong. So when you have a high enough voltage potential mm -hmm. and you have space, space is the ether, it's not filled with ether. Space is the ether, mm -hmm. okay? That ether is what is moving in through the atomic matrix of mass and is what is imparting a resistance to it as mass is accelerating. So that's where the effect of inertia comes from, right? So, but if you have a high voltage electrostatic potential, you're literally electrostatic repelling the ether around these electrostatic lines of force, which means it can't give any inertia to it, which means it's actually traveling almost like at a negative resistance, where it's instantaneously here to here, and the stuff that makes up space is being deflected around the electrostatic potential, which means it's not traveling any distance because it has to go through space. And what it's doing is it's electrostatically repelling that which makes up space around it. Okay, so here's a question for So you. it's instantaneous, basically. Since you're really good at describing and giving visuals with your hands and stuff, explain to me what happens with, you, with the body. This, you're sitting in the middle of it. What happens to your cells as you sit in the middle? Um, so everything in the cells, okay, so every cellular, first of all, every cellular action has nothing to do with the chemistry holding any kind of electrical charge and all this kind of business. That's not even what happens in batteries. So if you have a battery lighting a light bulb, there's no charge leaving the battery powering the light bulb until the battery runs out of it. When you charge a battery, all you're doing is you're electrically polarizing the chemistry to create a high and a low. That high and a low terminal on a battery is polarizing the ether around it. If there's nothing connected to the battery, you just have the ether polarized at these terminals. Okay? The ether is polarized at a certain pressure. 
it's like a gas pressure. So if you got 12 volts, you got 12 volts of pressure sitting at those terminals of the ether, which is polarized, because the dipole, which is that battery, those two poles connected by a common medium through the electrolyte, is polarizing the ether in the space around it. Once you connect the circuit with a wire and a little light bulb back down, then the polarized positive potential here can move over the surface of the wire through the light bulb to a lower potential, right? At nearly light speed, uh, electrical engineers will call that electromotive force, EMF. That's the second kind of voltage. There's voltage potential and then there's electromotive force. Then um, maybe one eleven trillionths or some ridiculous tiny amount of that uh, polarized ether flowing over the surface of the wire will go into the copper atoms themselves and will pull electrons out and the electrons will move in the opposite direction at a couple inches per hour. That's measured in amperage. So the potential to light that light bulb didn't come from the battery. It was powered by the ether all the time anyway. So people are asking, how do we tap the ether? Every dipole is polarizing the ether and is supplying the potential for any kind of work to happen. So when you see the electron loss, there's heat there, then you can say that there's energy. Well, we're, 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 every cell of our body and every drop of water that's in our body, and we're 99.9% .9 water, is dipole. So is that the mechanics basically operating the same principle? Exactly, because every cell in the body, there's all these chemical actions, these sodium potassium pumps, there's all this you know, ion movement here and there and whatever, is that none of the electricity at the cellular level for any biological process comes from any of those chemicals. All these chemical movements are creating a high and a low potential. Yeah. They create a dipole. The dipole in the vicinity of that chemical, that mineral, whatever it happens to be, is breaking the symmetry of the ether in its own local space. And that's where the potential comes from in order to get this electrical ac activity. Every dipole has access to the polarized ether at way higher voltage potentials than it normally has. So that explains it right there. So you're getting it to operate at a level that it normally would never operate at. So, so with the the plant experiments, so he had. So if you notice, all these um, these rings have a gap, right? Gap, 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 gap. The outer ring is okay. The reason for the gap, the outer ring, by the way, is the only one electrically con connected with a metallic conductor, which is the secondary winding, which is metallically connected to this ring. None of the other rings are connected el electrically. They're capacitively coupled. So there's a capacitance between here and here, between here and here, between here and here, and it diminishes as you kind of go down. What do you down. mean by capacitance? Um, it's, so it's not a physical electrical connection to the circuit, it's capacitively coupled. Anything in between, no matter how big or how small, this is going to automatically tune, uh, it just intrinsically will tune to that, to that capacitance. Okay. Lakovsky's rings around the plants always had a gap, right? They, it was coiled like this. Mm -hmm. And then they, you know, it might be overlapped like this, or whatever, and it was just like hanging on the plant or down at the root or whatever, right? Whatever length the copper ring happens to be is going to correspond to a whole wave, an, uh, a full wavelength. That's going to correspond to the length of that conductor, or it'll correspond to half of a certain wavelength, or a quarter of a wavelength, or an eighth of a wavelength, or a sixteenth of a wavelength, or whatever, right? In those fractions. So if you have a ring around the base of a plant you are corresponding to a full or fractional wavelength of the ambient frequencies that just happens to be operating in nature, right? So there's all kind, there's a whole super frequencies, say from cosmic radiation, whatever it is, okay, take your pick. But the fact of the matter is, is that ring is going to be resonating at a frequency that corresponds to the wavelength or fractional wavelength of that ring. And you have gaps in, in, in Every these. single one of these have a gaps, yeah. has a gap. Well, the interesting so, thing is that that actually brings the and then we'll go, then we'll go back to your buddies. But but but, but the plant okay. is 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 um, in contact is is being you know influenced by that resonating ring, which is going to be vibrating at a certain frequency. What is that called? Eco culture, eco electricity. Well, there's a le there's electro culture. Okay, that's it. That's what I was thinking. So about. that would be more of a reference to using high voltage electrostatic potential. That's what I was thinking. To enhance plant growth, 
it increases the, the tra uh, plants, what do you call it, transpiration or whatever, how fast it takes in water and exhales like water out. It increases that whole cycle uh, and then some. But that's electroculture. So this would be in the field of, you know, these alternative methods of utilizing, you know, electricity, magnetism, you know, electrostatic potential, grounding, whatever the stuff with plants. But yeah, that'd be in that category. So that ring is resonating at whatever frequency that the length or, you know, um, whatever frequency corresponds to that length or fractional frequency. So that ring is resonating. That plant is picking up that vibration and it's getting the plant to um, revert, you know, back into a healthier. It, it is, but it's just more than that. I'm, I'm looking at what they're doing with it and the amplitude of the way the plants grow. I mean, it's exponential. I mean, you could look at something and it looks really scrawny. You could look at the other side mm -hmm. of what's being enhanced by what you're kind of sitting in and it's it's exponential it's like it looks like eight times it's huge but look but also look how weak that system is i mean that's your talk yeah you know there, there's systems out there that are like flea power balanced units claiming to be mb mwo mm -hmm. okay flea power and if you're talking about just a ring resonating naturally by whatever frequency it course that length corresponds to how much power are you putting into that it's like the one of the, it's the most subtle thing you could possibly do, yeah. right? So then there's these um, circuit board antennas. Let me just grab one real quick. Here we come, he's coming right back. We're in um, Aaron's warehouse and Aaron is um, loaded with toys. <laughs> Aaron, bring it right up here by your, your mouth there. There we go. So these are, you know, so-called golden ratio um, MWO antenna circuit boards. These were designed by Eric Dollard years ago, not this size, but in the exact same proportion, mm -hmm. right? Because there's a formula for calculating the rings in relation to each other. Um, Eric came up with these years ago, uh, so you can see the gap. This is metallically connected to the outside ring, mm -hmm. right? But none of these others are metallically connected to it. They're capacitively coupled, okay? There's capacitance in between here. So with these rings, but also what he put on here was there's these strips which are kind of hard kind of hard to see but you can see that there's these strips right here on the back okay you can kind of see those those strips are on a second layer of copper which are over the gaps on the back side and that increases the capacitance to help them more ma closely match these but he came up with that years ago and i think the ones that Dollard had back then and you know, I saw Peter had one it was like blue or purple and it was like I think perfectly round and it's about this big right mm -hmm. and and you know Eric is very Conservative with claims and stuff like that and what people are saying and what's doing what and everything um, But there was a lot of reports of people getting benefit from those golden ratio MWO circuit boards that he designed years ago without any power being connected to them for the same reason that those plants are responding to a single ring like that. It, it seems like so, it, it, it is. So it has those kind of effects, yeah. even without putting power in it, because all of the all of these are naturally resonating right now. Mm. By what you know, it's going to be so subtle you probably can't really measure it. But you know, conceptually, each one of these corresponds to a frequency or a fractional wavelength of a particular frequency that's just a a ambient. In, in, you know, in the ambient, in the environment right now. And just so, so, so in, just so some people may not know, Eric Dollard is very well uh, renowned in the business of electricity. And from the time he was in fourth grade, he was picked up by um, Bell Systems by this teacher took the diagram and said, who is this person? We need to know him, and he's my fourth grader. So there's, and, men, there's men in suits yeah. showing up at his school. Yeah. And uh, so if you see that, so he's, you know, recognized as, you know, by many yeah. um, as being the uh, modern day Tesla and knowing more about the nature of electricity than any human being alive. And ericpdollar.com is the website for EPD Laboratories, Inc. And Eric helped design the layout inside here of the pulse modulator. Yeah. So basically, if the U.S. Navy and Bell Labs got together and wanted to make a pulse modulator, this is, how, this is what they would probably come up with. And there's different practice, high voltage, high frequency protocols and stuff like that that Eric incorporated in here that most engineers wouldn't know. And that's kind of a dark art, knowing how to, you know, uh, that side of things. 
Well, this takes yeah. us back then to the team. So this, this brings us back to where Dollard comes in and Linderman and mm -hmm. um, Babcock. So after John, um, the next person who I met was uh, Peter Lindemann. Peter Lindemann is, you know, a uh, world-renowned educator and historian and a lot of the these free energy type of sciences and, and uh, a lot of the works of Tesla. Um, he's published, you know, multiple multiple uh, books and presentations through Borderland. And um, I first met him in about, it was around 2001 or something like that. Uh, a friend, Grant Romont, came to town. I was introduced to him, and we drove up to Peter Lindemann's when he lived up in Medellin Falls. And that was the first time I met him in person. I talked to him on the phone one time in relation, it might have been about the Gray Motor stuff, the Ed Gray Motor. Uh, Peter had wrote a book called Free Energy Secrets of Cold Electricity, which was kind of his thesis on how he believed the Ed Gray Motor worked based on the information available at the time and the patents. Mm -hmm. And in about 2004, I think it was around 2004, Peter Lindemann um, got some funding for John Bedini to commercially develop uh, John's battery chargers, which can give lead acid batteries a theoretical infinite lifespan because it rejuvenates them and reverses the chemistry back to like new on every charge, whereas all conventional chargers will charge your battery and will degrade it over time, so you have to keep buying new batteries. And, that, and John's methodology is based on information going back a century. You know, it was in a book we called the Battery Bible, but it was teaching farmers who had milk machines powered by batteries how to basically keep their batteries indefinitely good. And that knowledge has been known by the battery industry for a century, and they're not going to tell anybody. But John's chargers that were developed out of a lot of this funding did those. And, you know, uh, Peter and I part partnered up in around 2007, 2008, and we started A&P Electronic Media. The first book we published was Lessons in Advanced Perception, mm. which had nothing to do with energy. It was about consciousness, which is, you know, the, kind of the spiritual and um, consciousness category was probably at the, f at the priority for basically all of us is what we have in common, even with John and Paul Babcock and, and everybody. But all these things are just so related. It's like, okay, you can only do so hands so much hands-on stuff with those kind of things. And, but all, all these are related in principle and mm -hmm. how they work and operate with nature and these open systems and stuff is identical to human and li living systems. And so, you know, Peter Lindemann, um, we worked on a lot of projects, published a lot of material. Um, he retired X amount of years ago, and then I took over and today, you know, published uh, I don't know, over 225 books and videos, which are all available on emediapress.com, which is this banner, right? Emedia Press. So emediapress.com, uh, a lot of books and videos that Peter and I published before we started doing the conferences. And then, you know, the conferences, all the videos are filmed. And so that really fed the catalog at a rapid pace. And by many in this field is considered the most authoritative catalog in the world for information in this category. Here's what I would like people to know. When you do the, when people come and you've done your workshops, mm -hmm. it's an intimate workshop mm -hmm. and you um, make sure people demo. So it's one of the places where a lot of the engineers mm -hmm. like to come, they like to co-create and converse, have great conversations. So mm -hmm. people like Linderman and Babcock and you are very accessible, very fun and very engaging. Mm -hmm. um, as much as possible, most of the presenters, I try to at least have first-hand knowledge of what they're working on and that it actually works and that they can bring stuff to actually demo and show working stuff because you don't really see that at a lot of places. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of the stuff is published where if people really want to take it on and do it themselves, the information is there. You know, there's, there's been a lot of exclusive disclosures on, on people's work at the conferences. Yeah. A lot of people want to hold on real tight to the, all, all, every little secret and this and that, you know, and everybody's got, got to write through their own proprietary information and stuff, but there's been a lot of disclosures. And so, you know, Peter Lindemann was instrumental, you know, so the original conference was the Bedini Lindemann uh, Science and Technology Conference or something. Then I called it the Energy Science and Technology Conference just to make it more generic and, you know, en encompassing. But uh, Peter and uh, John's, you know, friendship with, with me, that was at the root of starting the conferences, you know, 12, 13 years ago, and back in 2012. Yeah. 
Okay, we're back. We took a short little break there, okay. and we're 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 going to leave where we left off, and I think we left off with Peter Linderman. Okay, so you know, to to this day, there's been you know over 225 books and videos published because of those efforts. Uh, there's um, you know these RPXs I manufacture now, which is one of only two legitimate rife frequency generators manufactured anywhere in the world. That was invented by John Bedini and these MWOs. And again, one thing about these MWOs is that the sales for this, I don't receive any income from these. All this money goes into an account, funds all the overhead, and it funds projects like the Tesla turbine that you can't see behind here, uh, developed by uh, uh, Jeremiah Ferwerda, which is further along than anybody else in the world who's actually showing stuff about the Tesla turbine. We're light years ahead of that. Um, those kind of projects wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for people supporting what we're doing by buying these MWOs. And, and that's, that's, where the, that's where the money goes. And you're all locally created? This is all locally manufactured as much as humanly possible. If we get parts outside of Spokane, you know, I mean, the case for this is manufactured in Spokane, Washington. The rings are bent here, the coils are around here, all the, you know, the materials are sourced through a other company, but then they come here and Andre does the CNC mill magic on them to manufacture all these little parts and components and all that kind of stuff. So as much as possible, these, these are made in Spokane. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. Great. Which is actually where Bedini, Linderman, Babcock live. The only one that doesn't is Dollar. Yes. And I know they're not directly in Spokane, mm -hmm. but they're in the, what they call Spokane slash yeah. Coeur d'Alene mm -hmm. arena. So. And, and Eric has been up here for, you know, months at a time yeah. when, when we've been working on projects. And so, you know, yeah, P Peter was very instrumental in uh, uh, a lot of this. And, you know, and then there's uh, Paul Babcock. <clears throat> and so, you know, talk about Paul and then where, you know, Peter brought his MWO to Paul's and we can pick up on you know yeah. the sequence of how this evolved and so paul um peter actually introduced me to paul this was maybe in about 2004 or so so about 20 years ago uh on the north side of spokane in the historical garland uh village uh district um i owned a vitamin store called top of the line total health shop kind of co-owned that with my uh, mother uh i had bet you know i had a uh, Bachelor's of Science in Natural Health in um, that I got around 2001. I was working at a different vitamin store. My mom had always been uh, into herbs and everything, certified herbalist and you know all this kind of stuff. And uh, there was a health food store that was being sold that had been around since the 80s called Top of the Line Total Health Shop on Garland here in Spokane. And this lady named Pearl Schmidt, who was about 90 years old, she sold it to some lady who had it a couple years and saw it in the paper and uh, uh, bought it. I actually borrowed some money from uh, my mom. She borrowed against some CDs or something like that. And I walked into a business making profit right off the bat with no money out of my pocket. And I paid her my mom's um, c CD, which was used to secure that, that money back with money out of the, out of the, uh, the business. So that, that was a you know, good, good business experience, but I'll never own a retail store again, or at least I'll never work in one because um, the business owned me. Mm -hmm. But that was a good experience, and that was also kind of my headquarters because while I'm doing the health food store stuff and selling products and dealing with customers, in between that, I'm on a computer basically doing all this kind of stuff kind of behind the scenes, you know, not at this level, but, you know, my research, and, and that's where I started writing. You know, I started to... In okay, so in about bought the store in 2002, closed it in 2006 because of these leasing issues and a property and, and difficult to deal with people who were involved in everything. And so it's kind of a blessing in disguise because I went off and I've never looked back and have been, you know, doing my own thing ever since. Even though the health food store was, it does kind of pin you down. And so in about 2004, somewhere around there, Peter, I don't remember how Peter met. Uh, Paul Babcock told me about him and we went out and met Paul Babcock at his home out in Spokane Valley and we went into his home shop which is basically uh, his garage and that's where Flyback Energy started and at that time it was Paul one of his brothers and they were the founders of Flyback Energy and they had this big this motor that was you know encased in something that was about four by four feet or so 
and they had this rotor spinning with all these coils and stuff and and I didn't really understand it too much at that time but the critical thing about it was always his switching circuit Paul had these ultra fast switching circuits very little loss and he was able to you know a lot of these energizers and motors and stuff the, <coughs> the pulse motors they'll charge a coil and then they'll discharge it or, or turn the switch off magnetic field collapses and you got this high voltage spike people call it back EMF but that's not back EMF that's an inductive spike back EMF is happening at the same time that you got applied power to a coil and it opposes your forward you know uh, electricity so you get that inductive spike and you can put it into another battery so you're running on a battery pulsing this coil and the coil is charging another battery and you can switch the batteries back and forth and conceptually you can get them to stay charged up which has been proven over and over again not on a lot of these tiny little toy models and stuff that a lot of people were building you know um, and everything but that's you know Paul was basically doing the Bedini concept uh, his own way in a more sophisticated way in a more efficient way and a little bit larger scale so I met Paul uh, his brother I can't remember who else was there maybe one of his engineers James might have been there at that time or maybe he didn't come to Spokane yet and so ever since then hit it off really good with Paul and you know been, been uh, one of my best friends for 20 years you know good friend mentor learned a lot of stuff from him unfortunately he, he died a few months ago and um, in the middle of a lot of projects that we were working on and uh, so but those projects aren't dead there's things going on behind the scenes with um, you know some of his work that's going to move forward but it's got to take its own pace you know I, I have to stand back and let certain things happen in the right sequence but Paul um, so after Paul moved out of his shop and they got some funding or whatever one of his first shops was outside of his garage was out on Trent way out in, uh, in in the valley and he wasn't there too long and then they moved out to uh, Flora which is out towards Liberty Lake and he had his big shop got some funding and then started to work and and de de commercially develop this stuff working on you know lighting control systems with his uh, switching circuits you know switching these big banks of lights and stuff with this with these ballasts you know these transformers and stuff that are running so cold you can't even keep a cup of coffee warm on it you know he was able to make like 80 something percent of the light for like 40 percent of electricity or I don't know something like that so radically dropping the energy usage extending the life of bulbs recapturing all this energy and reusing it you know over and over again in a in pretty sophisticated way but it's 100 percent identical to what he was doing with his motors and so out at that location for flyback energy so this was oh I'd say 10 years ago maybe 2012 2013 it was kind of around when we started the conference in about 2012 somewhere right around there well Peter had this one MWO um, built by the guy in Michigan he fixed the line filter so it would stop turning his Wi-Fi router off and causing electrical havoc and all this kind of stuff so we got it working took it out to Paul's shop Paul used and experimented with that and a lot of people were testing it out and stuff for a while <clears throat> I think one to two years or something and I'd go out there periodically and I would just observe and I would sit in the MWO I would experiment with it and whatever <clears throat> and then eventually Paul got his hands on the reverse engineering report and then he built his own took him an entire winter just to make the rings for his MWO um, just doing that kind of part-time and stuff so it really is you know the, making the rings this antenna right here is um, it's kind of a work of art but it's also um, the biggest headache in manufacturing for these things but we got it we, we got it dialed in pretty good so Paul's using Peter's MWO Paul built his own based on the you know the real specifications um, and he had that one at his home you know uh, first sitting up in his garage for a long time before he took it down to his man cave you know by his house and you know so I saw what was going on with that but <clears throat> I saw enough where I was interested and I proposed the idea that you know what we, we need to put these into production uh, they're interesting they have um, there, there's a lot to it and there's a lot that can be learned from them and so 
Um, basically, I decided to put it into production and originally thinking, okay, yeah, hopefully, you know, the first units, we're going to be able to retail these for maybe about 4000 bucks. It's like, no way. You know, it, it just took took not that long before we saw there's a lot of, there's a massive amount of work involved with this. And, you know, from the old prototype stands and the smaller stands and the coils and how we had it and how the rings were done and everything. I mean, it was an absolute nightmare. And so, but to this day right now, we're on, you know, this is MD3AUA. So you can't see it in the camera, but the model MD is the uh, pulse modulator. So Eric did it Navy style with this data tag. 3A means it's the um, third generation, uh, like model A. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is an old test unit, RUP2, um, 3F or 3G or something like that. We're like on the sixth or seventh generation or something like that. And most of the enhancements or most of the upgrades in those newer generations are invisible to the user. A lot of them are streamlining the manufacturing, making it easier to build on the inside, those kind of things. And then UA means invisible rays. <laughs> so Eric came up with that using the actual Navy um, abbreviations for what it is. So. Um, There's something you talked about were debunking a concept. Do you want to go into that? Because that was something with the reverse engineering that you guys discovered while you were doing it. You mean as far as the concept of it being a multi-wave oscillator? Yeah, and how you how you talked about <coughs> the way what it yeah. was and wasn't. So I don't know if I would say it would be debunking. What it is is Lukowski didn't have the full understanding of his own machine. And there's going to be a lot of people who are going to disagree with me, but they're entitled to their own opinion, uh, but they're wrong. Uh, they believe in a lot of mythology. You know, each ring, you know, Sergio Lukowski, his son, and all this talking about how each ring corresponds to like, you know, different musical notes and all this kind of business, right? So the idea of a multi-wave oscillator and that each ring has its own resonant frequency. Okay, well, that may be so, but in what context? Maybe if you're resonating just this ring, or you're doing just this ring, or just this ring, or whatever, right? But what happens is, this ring is so capacitively coupled so close to this ring and this one to this ring and this ring to this ring that what it does is it introduces what is known as burden. So burden is an old school, it's an actual electrical terminology called burden. Just like there's inductance, capacitance, whatever, there's also burden. So these rings are burdening each other. They introduce a certain amount of burden. That burden prohibits any of these rings from resonating at their own individual frequency because they're clashing with each other and it creates more of like a soup so no ring is resonating at its own independent frequency because it can't because it's it's too capacitively coupled together and squashed together that all together it's making like a whole soup so the idea that you got all this individual little resonance on each of the rings happening while it's running that's not happening so as an example, you know, Eric Dollard is saying if you want each ring to resonate at its own individual frequency doing something like this, this outer ring might have to be 12 foot in diameter. And then at 11 foot diameter, you got the next ring. And then another foot in, you got the next ring. So that they're far enough apart from each other that they're not burdening each other. Then you can get a more clean signal on each particular ring. But with this setup, it's not happening. So technically, in that sense, it's not a multi wave oscillator. But there are multi-waves, if you want to call it that, it's a multi-frequency oscillator that there's a whole clash of frequencies. You've got the carrier frequency, right, in the AM band, but then you've got all this clashing happening, not only with this, creating different frequencies, there's some inherent unbalances built into the Lukowski multi-wave oscillator that nobody ever knew about until those Italian engineers came up with their reverse engineering report showing these features in what the real uh, MWOs had. So prior to that, every single MWO device out there claiming to be an MWO doesn't have any of those features. But there's a benefit to this that most people don't know about. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I can get up and walk around and show what, what those features are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain three things that most people don't know about the MWO, probably have never heard of, and people that were making MWOs in the past before, you know, about 12 years ago, 
never even knew about these features, so they actually don't have a Lakofsky multi-wave oscillator, and even if it's technically not a multi-wave oscillator in the sense that he might have believed or whatever is irrelevant, they have balanced systems, and I'll go into balanced versus unbalanced, but they all have balanced systems. That doesn't mean there's not a benefit to those machines, but they have absolutely no resemblance to what Lakofsky was doing. And that's an indisputable documented fact based on the actual production models Lakofsky was making in the early 1900s. Okay, so one of the imbalances that people don't know about is that these are the, these coils here. Um, this is a primary winding, and this is a secondary winding. And this is referred to as the TX, or transmitter coil. Even though they both technically transmit and receive, this is basically the transmitter one that has the, the primary on it, okay? This is the so-called receiver coil that has a secondary, but there's no primary here. Some of Lakovsky's original units did have a primary here, but it actually wasn't connected. It was just there to so-called, you know, balance the copper mass and whatever, right? But it actually serves no function. And it's not going to make any measurable difference. There's none, okay? But the secondaries, this secondary and this secondary, they have a slightly different number of turns. So typically how you would do this, do a high voltage system like this, is that you would have an exact same amount of turns because you want it balanced and that's how you would normally engineer something like that. Lakovsky had a different number of secondary turns here and a different number of secondary turns here. What that does is that that is one inherent unbalance that can assist in this clashing to actually create more noise and more a soup of harmonics and everything compared to a balanced system. So for an MWO to be authentic to what Lakovsky was doing, both secondaries need to have a different number of turns. Okay, here's another inherent imbalance that's built into the system is that he had the pulse modulator um, very closely connected to one of the coils. A lot of times you'll see this backed up to his big control units and then you had one of the coils and antenna sets right here next to it and then you at a distance you got the second set with a chair in between. Okay, if you want to look at the back here, this is where we have um, uh, the output. The green is not used unless you're using the balance transformer. So we do have a way to run it in a balanced mode, but that's as an optional add-on. By default, it's an unbalanced Lakovsky mode because it's legitimate. Okay, so these three reds are tied together. This is one phase and the black is another phase. So there's a pulse capacitor network in here. You could call it a resonant tank circuit tuned to a very specific frequency. So this is one phase. This is a second phase. These three cables right here are all tied together on the second phase. This black one here is going six feet this way <clears throat> to the input on this coil right here. Okay. One of the phases is going to one side of the primary coil and then the second phase is also going to the other side of the primary of the coil because you got to take that high voltage output at whatever polarity and you're putting it to the coil. When you do that, then the secondary steps that voltage up to that outer ring. And that's how you get, uh, you get that uh, magnification. Okay? Well, this, is, this primary is also essentially feeding that secondary. Well, to feed this secondary, this primary is like instantaneously connected to the secondary here. You see how close that is? Primary, secondary is right here, instantly, right? Well, what is the distance from the primary to the other secondary? 12 feet, because it goes here. 6 feet back to here, and then 6 feet out to here. So the length of the cables for the prime, so, so the distance that the primary is to feed this secondary and that secondary are vastly different. Here, it's basically connected directly to the secondary. It's 12 feet away from that secondary. That's another imbalance besides the fact that both secondaries have a different number of turns, slightly different number of turns. Hmm. That's a feature that nobody is putting into these MWOs claiming to be MWOs. But there's even these 
high frequency, high voltage machines today that they will associate the MWO name to and all these other names and they're just throwing all these names in there, Reif and Lakovsky and all this kind of stuff. They're all balanced units that don't have any of these considerations and they're not making as many harmonics as what this can do. The more harmonics, the more frequencies. The more frequencies, the more things you can target either in a whole wavelength or fractional wavelengths and the balanced units can't even come close to the amount of things that it can resonate because it's more of a clean, balanced system where they're not getting all this cl clashing and stuff. And that's exactly when you read his Secret of Life book, what his objective was. Of course. Yeah. Okay, so different number of secondaries turns, different distance from the primary to each of the secondaries, and then one of the third things that Eric Dollard absolutely cannot stand because he is a purist and no way would you take one of the phases and ground it. One of these phases is going right here to the ground prong, right? Mm -hmm. This is just for testing when we do testing in here, but ideally you want this going outside to a dedicated earth rod away from the electrical system to tie it into the earth. Lakovsky tied one of his phases to an earth rod in the earth. Interesting. Okay. okay. So if you take, so if you look at two prongs on an outlet, right? You got two prongs on an outlet and you got a ground prong. But if you took one of these, one of these two prongs, and if you tied it to the ground, make absolutely no sense. Hmm. A, conve uh, a conventional engineer would never design it like that. It's like, why would you ever want to ground one of the phases like this? It makes no sense. It's completely stupid. Eric, Eric doesn't like it at all because that's not the proper way to engineer something. And he's right. But Lakovsky did it for a very specific purpose because you want to get the earth involved in the system, right? I think it would amplify. And, and Eric Dollard does not like this grounding of the, one of the phases so much that he designed an oscillation transformer so you can bypass that primary over there and have a primary here with equal length windings driving it so you can actually run it in a balanced way. Well, the secondaries still have a different number of turns, but they're so close that it makes you can't really tell the difference. It's, and, and I'll show a demonstration with the light bulb in between, making a so-called neutral spot, in, in a black spot inside of the light bulb, demonstrating this counter space concept. But anyway, one of the phases is grounded. So if one of the phases is grounded, you'll notice that Lakovsky, he had metal plates that were grounded that the bare feet go on so that when this coil fires and, and this longitudinal impulse is here with one particular polarization, some of it gets here, but the rest goes through the person, through their feet, and it, to the earth ground. Because the earth plate is going to ground, which means it's finding the ground through the other phase that's also grounded. So that's how you're introducing the earth to it. It's actually going through down to the earth. Does that create like a full circuit in a sense? Basically, that's where it's finding its path. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, through the person to the earth, back up to that phase. So that's where it's finding a ground is back to that. And it just phase. seems like it's amplifying everything then. <clears throat> um, so when this fires, you know, yep. so it's kind of going down through the earth like this. Yeah. This one fire is going down through the earth like this, right? None of these systems that are balanced can do that. If it's balanced and one of the phases is not grounded and it's not the Lakovsky type system, you're more bathing in it rather than having it move down through to the earth. That doesn't mean that there's no benefit, but it has absolutely nothing to do with Lakovsky. This is one of the two units anywhere in the world that is electrically correct compared to what Lakovsky was doing. The guy in Minnesota or Iowa, wherever he was, Wisconsin or whatever, he, you know, he retired years ago. He's not making them anymore. Uh, my friend in Croatia still makes his. This one is made. It looks like there might be one made in Russia or somewhere. Um, I'm not sure if that one is authentic or not, but I see all these other ones from like, you know, the ones that were made before the reverse engineering report where, you know, Australian, New Zealand, and there's, you know, some of these others, and they have absolutely no resemblance to anything that Lakovsky did. It was all based on nothing but pure belief, but they keep claiming that it's a Lakovsky multi-wave oscillator. 
but it doesn't incorporate these features. So what you just saw here is the defining characteristic of what makes it an electrically correct Lakovsky multi-wave oscillator. Nice. Very nice. And we're, we're certainly the only company in, in the North American continent that's, you know, do, doing the real thing. So that's what, so that's what Lakovsky was doing and that's why he grounded one of the phases to introduce the earth to it. So, so we can we, run it in the unbalanced mode and then we can also run it in the balanced mode and I can show you the difference. In and, and you have the arc. You want to show me the arc part too? And so you want to grab that and turn it on? Yeah. So I'll, I'll take a fluorescent tube and I'll just, you know, sh show a little okay. spark and I'm not going to, I'm not going to blast it full blast, but we'll run it for a bit just to see the concept. And then I'll run it in the balanced mode and then you can see a distinct difference with what happens with the light in between the tubes. Okay. It's pretty interesting. So, um, we'll take a quick break. I'm going to turn the lights off so you can kind of see it better. Okay. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave it in the, the, the default um, Lakovsky uh, unbalanced mode. And uh, I'm going to turn it on. I'm not going to run it full blast. I'll just do enough where you can kind of see the, the concept. So, I'm going to turn it on. I'm just going to turn this timer on for a few minutes there. I got the spark gap turned way down. Okay. I'll turn the spark gap up just a little bit. So this does have an adjustable gap. Lakovsky had an adjustable gap, and there's actually four spark gaps in series. And that creates even more harmonics. With all the different clashing and the noise and the radio frequency business. Unbalanced, in the unbalanced mode, the trans, so-called transmitter side is always strong, stronger th than the receiver side. Okay, and I don't have it cranked, cranked up right now. But this side is supposed to be stronger than this side. Okay, and the outer ring is the only one electrically connected to the front, the secondary windings. All the rest are capacitively coupled. So it's supposed to get weaker as you go towards the middle. Okay. So what you see is that um, the light lights up pretty much anywhere in the vicinity. I'm completely receiving it. Yeah. You're even receiving it out here. I mean, I'm you know four, four feet away and the tube is still lit. Yeah. You know, I can still lit out here. Um, you know, so the so it extends a pretty good distance. So even if you're standing out here, you're still receiving it. Um, just not as strong as if you're, you know, in the middle there, right? Right. Okay. So now, and here's another thing with this mat. I would never ground it, and the mat's not even really necessary. I just do it because it concentrates the conductivity of the concrete a little bit better. Okay. Turn it back on. But all I want to demonstrate real quick Can you see that sparking? Yep. I can do You want to do it again? You can hear that, right? I'm just trying to keep it like this. I don't know if it's going to be something like this. I don't know if it's going to be something See when I'm in, yeah, see this bulb? Yeah. This tube, right? Yeah, I'll turn it over. If I look up, you see how that candid? Yeah. It goes dim because the emission is going through my finger to the mat, through the concrete, to the ground where it's grounded in the outlet bone. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And when I let go, this is more lit up because there's not enough good ground, so it's, it's more in the atmosphere around it, right? Yeah, you can see that. Can you tell me that's not sparking? I mean... Can you see that? Yep. Right? Oh, yeah. You can see that, right? Yep. That's amazing. Well, that goes back to... That goes back to Lukowski's idea. So see, but we're on concrete. That's the point I'm trying to make. Okay. <laughs> Is that the high voltage and high frequency 
see if you got a good ground. This tube is really lighting up because there's a good ground to channel. You see, it's seeking ground, right? The emissions are looking for a lower potential. Well, there's no more, the, the lowest potential that there is is to the, to the ground. Okay. Because the system is, one of the phases is grounded to the um, outlet. It should be up to an earth rod. It would do the same thing, <coughs> just cleaner. But what that means is this is absolutely finding a ground straight through that concrete, right? Wow. Right? Wow. See that? Yep. Right? Got it on my. But the point is, is that's the ground. So that's why Lakoski had a metal foot plate, but for safety reasons, you don't want to use a metal foot plate. You don't want to tie the tab of, an, of it. You don't want to ground it. Demonstration, you can obviously see absolutely this is going into the concrete and it's finding ground. Otherwise, that would not light up. This will do it on carpet. It'll do it on wood. It'll do it on concrete. It almost doesn't matter what it is. So, you know, just kind of trailing over the surface of it. And so when people ask, well, what, you know, do I need, what kind of floor and stuff do I need? It almost, it doesn't really matter. So now I'm going to show the uh, balanced mud. Okay. One th the one thing I just, for me, being somebody who's not an expert in any of this, it just seems to me that it just shows that our whole world is lit up. Um, we're always in that electrostatic potential. Yeah. Inside the uh, Earth uh, ionospheric connection. Mm hmm You know, we're, we're basically in between capacitor plates. We're inside of a living capacitor, you know, between the ionosphere and the Earth. And... And it nourishes us and feeds us when it's in the right mode. The one thing Lakovsky did speak of, which we're having a, a ton load at the moment, is uh, he called them sunspots, that when there were different times, it affected even uh, war. That these, the, if, if you think about the explosion of the sun or the solar mass ejections, it actually affects our mood. Yes, it does. Do you want to explain that a little bit? Uh, that'd be a conversation now with Eric Dollard. <laughs> he's, he's studied more about the sun than anybody I know. Um, but uh, if you want to come over here, I can explain the setup on this. Okay. Um, I, I was going to say, you know, when I think of the transformer. concept, I think of the idea of charge. <clears throat> and when you're more charged and you have more, more intensity relative, you would be more just literally more agitated, more energized, more... Yeah, excited it can stir you up yeah more excited more everything um, so yeah so you want me to get closer to yeah and hopefully hopefully you can see see this okay so here we go i'm getting with close light, i don't see you out. but i see your machine okay so inside here is essentially one of these uh primary coils okay okay but right now i don't have the black cable coming over here anymore i have this red cable mm -hmm. coming from this side of the primary going here mm -hmm. and then i have this one going there so it's no longer um, a primary that's instantly here right but 12 feet away from there right this is this side of the primary output is exactly six feet there and then exactly six feet there okay and then it's center tapped at the zero voltage point which goes to the chassis ground and this is the only time you use the chassis ground and that's okay. for safety okay this is going to the chassis on here okay and we do not ground one of the phases okay okay so simply we got two phases right mm -hmm. but let's just say black and red phase are going equal distance to the input of the primary okay and then the output of the primary is going equal distance to those so this primary is no longer even being used it's okay. completely bypassed now we have a balanced system the only thing that's not balanced is that we got a different number of turns on the prime on the secondary mm -hmm. But it's the the turns are not enough to to make a real difference. Okay. Okay. So this is a balanced mode, and essentially, it's a lighter variation of what Eric called the cosmic induction generator. So if you you know been following the presentations and the conferences and stuff, we can take different types of plasma tubes with di different types of gases in them, put them in between the cosmic conduction generator specifically made for those experiments we can play music through it 
you know, do all this kind of stuff. We've got gases to light up to colors that are not supposed to be associated with those gases. That changes a lot of stuff. I mean, astrophysicists and whatever, you know, they're predicting distances of different galaxies and stars and all this kind of stuff based on their color emissions, right? Because they're going to say, hey, that has one certain uh, color, which is going to correspond to a certain something. And, you know, they're, they're making all these guess, guesses about it and about the size of the universe and all this kind of stuff. Well, if we can take a silly little tube in a, with normal electron high voltage, uh, it's purple, like the little plasma balls, you know, with little streamers and you put your finger around it and stuff. Yep. That is going to be like this violet or this uh, purplish color, right? Okay, well, we can put it in between the cosmic conduction generator and then it's like a, a bluish white color. Where did the purple go? Why are we able to get a color change in a gas? That's supposed to be something that's like immovable. That's like if transmutation you, of elements if, if in got, a sense. If you got a certain gas, it's supposed to have a certain color emission, but we've seen colors actually change with different gases from one to another or transitioning from one color to another. So there could be, you know, pieces of the, the electrode material potentially off-gassing, contributing to it, whatever, but nevertheless, we're getting some interesting results that nobody else is showing doing that kind of stuff. Well, we're not going to get that with this setup. We're not going to be playing music through this setup, but we will get the neutral zone. Okay, so like, am I going to step back and put you in there? Yeah. So if you, if you want to go, go back over there a little, little bit further away, I'm going to... Go ahead and click it on. Okay, we're running at the same power and everything, but now it's in a balanced mode. So now the spark is about the with the same power input, the spark is about e equal length on, on each side. See, I'm drawing pretty much equal length sparks on both sides. Look at this balance, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is no longer just lit anywhere. If I go from here, look at that. In the middle, it goes dark. And if you got in the right spot, you'll actually get like a black spot that'll move in this too. Mm. Why is it a black spot? There's high voltage there. So if you there's cancellation or what's going on, there's a couple different explanations, conventional explanations for it. But that dark spot is a spot where Eric calls counter space and counter space is a doorway into a different dimension energy is desynthesized in that spot which means energy is being destroyed going into that spot and what they did because the idea that energy cannot be destroyed it can only be you know transformed from one form to another it can't be created or destroyed complete nonsense because that doesn't that's not even what energy is because everybody uses energy and potential incorrectly. But without going into all that, uh, they had a cosmic conduction generator set up in the past, pumped X amount of RF real watts out of these coils, and it was disappearing into that spot with no signs of heating, and it was all pl plotted and charted, and that was a presentation given long ago where everything was graphed out, and you can see that energy was basically desynthesizing or disappearing in that neutral zone. So where is it going? So conceptually, if you can make energy disappear and desynthesize or be destroyed in a certain spot, can you create it out of that spot by tapping into that dimension? And the way people refer to space as like three dimensions and the fourth dimension time, that's all nonsense too. And we can, we can get into that if you want. But I just wanted you to see that this neutral spot is right here, which, which is a huge, if you can see that spot right there? Yeah. Right? Let me, let me get a little closer so they can really see your difference with, uh, with the light in the middle. Oh, that goes dim right there. Wow. Interesting. And it's not because it's too far from the antenna. Because I can go even further out here and it's still lit up. Right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm well, about five, six feet away from that that antenna over there and it's still it's being lit up out here so it's not going dark because it's too far i'm i'm three four times the distance mm -hmm. is in the inside but then i can make it go dark 
So this neutral zone, this point of counter space, is of significant interest and study. I would like to see experiments where people are germinating seeds, find a neutral spot, put some type of plastic stand right here, get exactly where that neutral spot is with a, with a little tube, and then germinate seeds there. You know, turn it on for like five minutes every day for a week or whatever while it's germinating or whatever and just see what happens. You know what I'm saying? Those yeah, the you, kind did, of you have a, a hypothesis of what you think would happen? Well, just see what, if anything happens. Yeah, okay. You know? So this is a very distinct difference yeah. compared to the unbalanced mode. Yeah. You know, it's, it's truly more e you know, equal. And Eric designed that because he can't stand the unbalanced grounding one of the phases. <laughs> and there's actually a feature in that balance transformer that nobody else has. I'm not going to talk about it, but it's something he invented when he was very young. And it's... Um, so I'm not going to go into it, but that's not a regular... Uh, transformer or primary just getting a secondary. There's something else going in there. People can look at it and they won't even know what I'm talking about. Okay. But th that, that's, there's something unique about that transformer and how it's how it's working. Okay. And uh, Eric came up with that, I think when he was a kid, actually. So anyway, that's the, uh, that's the balanced mode. Um, and we just offer this as an add-on for people who want to just experiment and play around with the balanced mode and experiment with that neutral zone and, you know, that kind of thing. So I'll go ahead and uh, kick the lights on and then... Uh, so, so that counter space zone, you know, uh, that Eric says... Well, let's start for a second. Let's yeah. go here. We just had an experiment that showed there was sort of a gap and a, a spot where things mm -hmm. sort of disappeared too. So let's start with... When you showed that, what happened? And what, what, so start, so it's like a whole new thought. Yeah, so it's, so it's kind of a light version of a cosmic induction generator, is what Eric called it. Okay. Um, those, that whole concept came out of some tube experiments and different stuff Eric was doing, you know, years ago. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, some of it had to do with talking to Philo Farnsworth, the inventor of the television's son. Mm -hmm. um, who had one tube from some of his dad's work and they were one-upping each other on all these stories and and Eric basically kind of figured that there was something that happened very significantly in one particular tube. Eric had um, done some experiments with different tubes and formed a gout where the plasma turned into like a galaxy. Okay, and then the, the glass exploded. Well, there's no more vacuum inside that bulb or pressure, or just it's just ambient, and that galaxy formation lasted for X amount of seconds. So that was a big, you know, inspiration or something to Eric that always stuck in his mind. You know, and the co the concept of the cosmic conduction generator, I think it comes from a the name is from a Wilhelm Wilhelm Reich book called Cosmic Superimposition. And you know, er Eric's talked about that in multiple interviews and and whatever. But it's, um, you know, kind of have these co creative formative forces, you know, in, in the universe and space and that's imparted into our physical reality and stuff. And, and it's like, it, are we seeing some of these formative creative processes happening inside of some of these tubes? You know, like we were able to show, you know, different gas tubes with different gases. And when they're in that neutral zone, we get different effects that we've been able to see different colors from different gases changing and transitioning from one gas to another or different color to another or to another. <clears throat> There's one tube that has this spectacular light show with a whole bunch of different colors at the same time. All these little balls and different stuff floating. It looks like something out of the outer limits. And when Eric says dimension, he means a real dimension and not a phony dimension like most people refer to space. So people are caught up in this idea of space is three-dimensional and fourth dimension time and all this kind of stuff which is completely nonsense. So what I mean by that is that space is one dimensional. So there's only one dimension to space and that's the dimension of space. So to me, space is the ether. Not, space is not filled with ether. Space is ether. If there's ether, there's space. So, and it's one dimensional. X, Y, Z are not different dimensions of space. They're different coordinates. And coordinates are not dimensions. So you're sitting about six feet away from me. 
you are at a different XYZ coordinate than I am. But if they want to call them dimensions, then that means you're at a different dimension than I am because you're at a different XYZ. So people are erroneously equating a coordinate with a dimension. Because if XYZ are dimensions, and they say that that's three-dimensional space, literally, they're saying you are in a different dimension than I am. That also, that kind of reminds me of vortex-based mathematics, because it's all based on a coordinate, it's all based on a number. You're thinking about that. But we're still in one dimension of space. Exactly. We, we're, we're not in two different dimensions. No. Because you're at a different XYZ. We are in the same singular dimension of space at different coordinates. Yeah. And time is is it can be a dimension mathematically in terms of having a variable of time how long something takes but time is basically inseparable from that that ether because the ether depending on the density of that ether is supposed to be incompressible but you can have the ether at different voltages different which is different pressures and this is really high pressure ether right here um, at, you know, maximum if this is cranked up 300,000 volts or something. Okay, well that's a lot of pressure that that polarized ether is at. Well, the, the more pressurized ether is, um, the slower time is going to tick within that region because the ether is compressed, which is going to restrict the movement of mass within it. If that ether is at a lower density, okay, time is going to tick faster because there's less resistance to the mass within it. So all those relativistic effects with time dilation and all this stuff with mass moving and you know inertia and all this kind of stuff is not inherent to the mass itself because there's no energy in mass. It's all a property of space, which is ether being imparted into the mass as it's moving through the ether. You know, so you take an object and you accelerate it really fast well, it's going to get inertia. There's a, there's a certain amount of inertia that's going to resist its acceleration. Um, <clears throat> that's because as a mass is moving, it's encountering more ether per unit of time, which is going to give an apparent increase of density of that ether. If something is accelerating super, super fast, it's encountering more ether per unit of time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's um, going to give the same effect as being in a high density area. If that ether is super dense relative to the object because it's accelerating really fast through it, it's going to resist its movement through it. That's what inertia is. Time is slowing down when something accelerates faster and faster and faster, time starts to slow down. That's because the density of the ether is increasing, so everything inside that dense, increasing density area of uh, the ether, which is more and more dense, everything is unfolding slower and slower and slower. So that's the pressure cooker. Would that be like going from yeah, coal, like, coal to diamond? It's like being in a pressure cooker. Yeah. So it's like you were slowed down. It looks like light is still moving at a normal speed, but that's because you are restricted by the increased density of the ether. Every neural synapse is slowed down. The spark is going slower. Your perception, your consciousness is slower. Light is moving slower. Everything is slowed down within there. But it's always going to look normal from within that one frame of reference. And if you're in a lower density area, your neural synapses are firing quicker, your consciousness, your awareness, light is moving faster and everything else. But to you, it still looks like normal speed. So you can't see somebody else's frame of reference from within your own because it's all how time is flowing and how everything is moving is always going to be governed by the density of the ether. So when light is moving from a star coming to the earth and we observe it, it's been sped up and slowed down so many times, how far is that star really at? Because we're going to see that, oh, it's moving at, light is moving at light speed, not taking into the fact that it is moving through different regions of space where the ether is more dense or less dense, which is going to speed it up or slow it down or whatever. But when it comes into our region of ether at our ambient density of the ether, it's going to look like it's moving at normal light speed. So we don't see the slowdowns and speed speed ups. You'd have to have an omnipotent, you know, God view of the universe to see, oh, this is speeding up and slowing down and whatever. But within the own frame of reference, it's always going to look normal. And that's why it's completely governed by the density of the ether. Okay, so, so, with so that's all, what time is. Okay, so you, you, I know and you know that a lot of you guys 
a lot of us guys, <laughs> are have a, what we would call more of a, a very spiritual tinge um, in this in this um, arena. And a lot of people know that they get their inspiration from the ether. So how do you relate this etherical wisdom or knowledge that's embedded into the whole thing within that construct? Um, I believe that the information is inside the ether. Uh, you know, the so-called you know book of life, akashic records, the collective unconsciousness, all these kind of concepts. Rupert Cheryl Drake talks about these you know morphic fields, but that terminology actually came from Gustav Le Bon, who's never mentioned. Gustav Le Bon. Laban talked about. Um, uh, can't remember the name of of his his books, but Laban is the one who coined the, those terms like morphic or morphogenic type fields. And what period was he from? Late 1800s, early 1900s. You know, the Enlightenment period just mm -hmm. seemed like it birthed genius, and where. Well, it's natural philosophy is what it comes down to. Is yeah. looking at nature. At, trying to figure out nature, the, the nature of nature in and of itself, yeah. rather than all this compartmentalized business. And so, you know, that's what my interest is, is looking at the nature of nature. It's a philosophical, it's a, uh, it's natural philosophy. Yeah. You know, looking at how these things tie together. And, you know, so my viewpoint is from my own inspirations and insights and observations, but knowing, you know, um, John Bedini, you know Peter Lindemann, Paul Babcock, Jim Murray, uh, Tom Bearden, a lot of these other people in this field, and they, you know, Eric Dollard, and they got their own viewpoints of how all these things are kind of put together, you know, from their own perspective. And I can see that when they're explaining different things, they're explaining the same thing with their own kind of explanations. So I use that as my Rosetta Stone. To translate, because I'm kind of making a, an, an amalgam between all of those and my own insights to kind of unify and tie together their schools of thought into one cohesive model that makes sense, you know, to me. Yeah. You know, um, John Bedini said the meters only measure what's lost when you're measuring like amperage in an electrical circuit or whatever, right? You're looking at this electron current moving. So the meters don't measure what's there, it's only measuring what you're losing. Mm. Okay. Uh, Eric says energy is the rate at which electricity is destroyed. So they're talking about the exact same thing with their own perceptions. So I'm trying to look at it from a point of view that I can see what they're each saying and trying to, you know, form this cohesive model that explains it. You know, so in uh, 2005, 2005 or so, I wrote a book called Synthesis of Matter, and that was my attempt at kind of creating a unified field model to explain things to my own understanding, and I never even intended to publish it. And then that turned into a book called The Quantum Key, which I, which I did, and then... Didn't that relate to something relative to synchronicity and things that have happened to you in your life? Um, I have a model of synchronicity that ties in with my unified field model, which is a dynamic, fluidic ether type model. Um, it's a little bit different, but it is related. But then a handful of years ago at the Eagles Lodge, when we had the conferences out there, I gave a presentation called Hacking the Ether. Mm -hmm. And that was basically a little over two hour presentation on the model that I've been able to tie together from, you know, all my friends that I've known over the years, you know, looking at their, the outcome of their experiments. Mm -hmm. And I give heavy, um, weight to them actually getting results, not just talking about theories and ideas and stuff. You know, they're builders, they build stuff, they make things work. So what they say means a lot more than just somebody who is just talking about theories and ideas and stuff like that, that can't make anything work. I don't really have much interest in, in what those people say. They might have something interesting to say, but if somebody's building something, I can see that, okay, maybe they may not explain, you know, John Bedini wasn't the greatest communicator. But he was doing all kinds of stuff nobody else could get to work. He knew what he meant when he was trying to explain it. And I can see what he meant. But he's not the best at being able to spell out, give the whole technical definition, what's going on, and make the analogies and all that kind of stuff. But he damn sure knew what he meant. And I could see that. And so just, you know, tying all those all those pieces together over this many years and, you know, meeting John Bedini for the first time in 
1999, you know, so that's 25 years ago or whatever, 26 years almost, that um, I've been formulating my viewpoint on that, you know, for, for whatever it's worth, but it's, it's worked for me, and I've, for the most part, been able to, you know, predict the outcome of all my experiments ahead of time because I got a model to work with that, that works. Well, you, you've, you've um, <clears throat> explained your starting in a sense, so I would ask you a question. For the youth who are actually looking to find their way okay. and love science, what would you recommend? It depends on what aspect of science they're interested in. I mean, if it's... You took an unconventional road. <laughs> I did. Um, it, it, it well, it's the synchronicities that kind of guided me into everything, right? And, and I never actually went out and sought any of these people as teachers or anything. So, you know, for years people, you know, trying to get to John Bedini and, and Eric and all these other people, and um, I never really did that. I kind of had certain desires in mind, and through unusual synchronicity, someone would introduce them to me. And those became, you know, the, some of the best friends and mentors I could have ever had in this, in this field. So it was, it's like I had no agenda, you know what I mean? I met with them. Uh, but you, had, I, I, but you I, had one question that you always said, I love learning mm -hmm. for learning, or I love wisdom for wisdom. No, I, I did, but that's why they were brought into my life. That's what I'm saying. But I yeah. never sought them to find their secrets or whatever. But they came to you, you know? and then because that was your question and your quest, mm -hmm. the universe in its synchronistic ways answered your quest. Mm -hmm. So I, I think... No, absolutely it yeah, did. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that... that that paved the whole path for me. Yeah. So it's, it's like I had, had a guiding hand that just kind of walked me from here to here and here, you know, the right time at the right place. But I never had an agenda as far as like, oh, John Bedini has X, Y, Z. Let me try to see if I can fi find out what he knows. So let's start this one again, just you as know. a question, because I think this is a good one. Mm -hmm. you, you had a life path. You had a life mm -hmm. question. And your life question seemed to take you on a, on a path of, of synchronicities. Why don't you explain mm -hmm. that? Well, in 94, 95, when I thought I came up with the term free energy because I didn't know any better, and I'm doing these stupid things with the bicycles and the curtain rods with the magnets on them and all this kind of business, um, you know, I, I thought I was going to do something with this for, well, there was, there was a handful of different areas, you know, one was the so-called free energy, one was consciousness, one was uh, health and healing, one was green building, and... Um, one is agriculture. Those were the five areas that I was attracted to, that I felt like I had something to do with, or I, I, those were the areas that were interesting to me. Okay. And not like I randomly just picked, but it just kind of happened to where one thing led to another, and it's like, this is what I'm interested in. At that time, 94, 95, internet's kind of new. I didn't really know anybody. I had just recent, relatively recently came back from Japan after staying with some friends I went to high school with on one of the Air Force bases over there and kind of planted my feet. And then, you know, all these different things started to, to unroll. And then I just kind of planted this, all these seeds here, kind of detached from it, right? Let it go. And then in the next few years, one thing after another, happened that just introduced me to all these people. And you just, just kept getting aligned <clears throat> with your deep down purpose. Now the interesting thing that you say with all of these different aspects, they do have a commonality that 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 it speaks to. You near when you're talking about even what you're sitting next to, it's all energy. Every single one of them, whether it's agriculture, whether it's healing, whether yeah, there's energy, a, that there, they all there, relate to one thing. Yeah, there, there's a there's a common thread through all of them. I mean, there's common thread through everything. Those things are, are my my priori you know my my priorities, I guess. Um, but there does need to be a conversation about ener energy in, in and of itself because th there there is no such thing as energy. Uh, there's potential, and the ether is potential. The ether is raw potential in an unorganized, homogeneous, chaotic form just bubbling about, okay? And when you have a dipole, you polarize the ether and you create a asymmetry. So it's from a symmetrical nature, a dipole will polarize the ether in its local space and it creates an asymmetry. When you have an asymmetry and the ether is polarized at the terminals of a dipole, then it can move from a that organized high potential 
over a circuit down to a low potential. That movement, that potential, that electromotive force, see engineers talk about electromotive force, but they don't tell you what it's made of, is polarized ether at the terminal of a dipole, the positive terminal, which is polarizing the ether, and that polarized gas is moving over the conductor from one point to another. So that EMF, the electromotive force, which is a second type of voltage, voltage potential, is a measurement of a battery sitting there. That's voltage potential, that's the first kind of voltage. So that's just the gas pressure of how much ether is sitting there at that terminal because it's polarized at a certain gradient. The second kind of voltage is that electromotive force, which is moving from the positive terminal over the wire to the negative terminal. That electromotive force is that polarized ether gas at a certain pressure moving. So that's not energy, that's just potential. That electromotive force is organized pure potential moving over the wire. When it can pull and attract some electrons from the copper atoms of the conductor in the opposite direction. They'll move a couple inches per hour towards that positive terminal. That's going to be measured in amperage. When you see that amperage, what that means is that's watts. So you got volts times amps is watts. Watts isn't even energy, that's just a power reading. But watts for a certain period of time is energy electrically. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of us as humans. Us as humans have a potential, but you still have to have movement. You have to create. And sometimes you need the pressure and you need the charge, and then we do get to measure it. You have to resist. The, the potential has to meet resistance in order for work to be done. Is that why sometimes we have issues in our life? Because sometimes. But even if you're doing good stuff, you're still, there's still energy there. Okay. When, when there's a resistance, whether it's through working, building something, whatever it happens to be. So like on electric circuit, the EMF is voltage. If there's no electrons flowing, there's no watts, which means there's no power for any amount of time, which means there's no energy. So if you're just sitting on your couch, the same thing. <laughs> I guess. You're rotting away. It's, uh, you're not using your potential. But if you have the voltage of the electromotive force multiplied by the amperage, which is the electron current, then you got watts. Well, watts has to be expended for a certain period of time. Then you got watt seconds. That's energy. That's heat being produced. Work is being done. And only when work is being done is there energy. So there's no such thing as energy. Energy is the activity that potential experiences as it's being dissipated back to equilibrium through a resistance. So the stuff, the actual real stuff, is that polarized ether. That's the stuff. That's the tangible stuff. That almost sounds like the mind has to get up and move, and you, you have to get off the couch, and you have to go create. You, you're, you're within this potential. There's always a spark for you to ignite an idea, to do the things, which you've done tenfold. So, I mean, even from just your idea, um, the universe works with you, but not for you. You have to do the work. So it will, yeah. it will show up, and many things showed up for you. And every time the opportunity came, it you took the opportunity, and you kept. It was like you said. I started out. I didn't know anything. Maybe, maybe not always, but enough. Yeah. You know. Um, and you were curious enough. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And it sparked more imagination, and it sparked more curiosity. And you didn't stay home. You went and you mm -hmm. called and you did. And I mean, I, I did stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have a whole warehouse here full of so, stuff. <laughs> stuff that we've done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah pretty crazy but it is but but, like, look look at where you've come from just being curious but but the whole but the whole you know uh, you know going back to the idea of energy okay it, it's important it's an important distinction and it's not just semantics it's correcting and making sure people understand what they're saying people are going to say oh the universe oh it's just it's all energy well, you look out there, there's almost no energy happening. It's just pure potential. Mm -hmm. It's mostly black, empty space with nothing but ambient ether sitting there that's not polarized. And you see these little dots. And no matter how many trillions or, you know, multi-trillions of galaxies and whatever's in the universe and stuff, out of all the universe, if you collected all those together, it's a tiny little dot compared to all the blackness and emptiness, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So in the universe, there's hardly any energy happening. It's all potential. There's very little energy. You know, you look at, um, you know, people are talking about 
okay, energy. Well, if no work is being done, work being defined by joules of potential being dissipated and actual heat being produced or whatever, if the potential is not dissipating from to a resistance in one way or another, whether it's gravitationally, electrically, chemically, or in any other way, there is no energy. So if you have a thought and you're thinking about something, okay, yeah, maybe there's energy because you're burning calories just thinking, but the thought in and of itself, a so-called intangible, however you want to tie that into the etheric medium, you know, the, the medium of thought, because I don't believe memories reside in our brain, um, it's in the ether, you know, the more present you are in a moment, the more you're aware of in any particular moment. The more present you are, the better you're going to recall it down the road. Mm -hmm. So down the road, when you have a memory, it's not because you're recalling it from your brain cells, it's because your consciousness is bilocating to that point in time and space that you're recalling, and the more present you are, the more of an existence that 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 period has in the ether to embed your experience in there. So if you're not paying attention and whatever and you try to remember, well, if you're not very present, you didn't create that strong of an impression in the collective. So when you remember something in the past, you are bilocating consciousness, and that's the closest thing that anybody's going to have to time travel to be able to go into the past and recall and, and visualize something, is that's what we're doing all the time anyway when we, when we remember something, bilocating going to that moment. The more present, the more impression it has in a collective, the better we're going to remember something. And that's, you know... Make me it, think of remote viewing. Well, it's exactly what it is. You know, so, you know, I've, I've done technical remote viewing off and on since about 2005, 2006 or whatever. But that is, you are bilocating to the target site and there's different protocols that you do with... Um, you know, the target reference number and these ideograms you write and you decode them and you go through this very methodical regimen in order to get your uh, subconscious mind connected to the uh, signal line to that target that you want to look at. And when you're bilocating, you're basically doing the same thing as just remembering something, but it's a very specific protocol to for the um, uh, subconscious mind to be able to access and feed and percolate these ideas down into your conscious thinking mind so you can be aware of them. So when then you, you jot of, them down. You make me think of then what is, how, do you, how does imagination work in the field? Imagination? Mm -hmm. I don't know, I suppose you're just grabbing onto all this d different pieces of data and whatever is the path of least resistance to what you're desiring you're going to be latching onto because it's going to be, you know, so-called in resonance. Whatever I mean, that's how synchronicity works, is that if you're looking for something, whatever happens to be the path of least resistance is going to be attracted to you. Like, let's just say somebody else, you're trying to sell a certain kind of car. Somebody else is selling that exact car. You walk into a grocery store and they're both pinning, that person is pinning a for sale sign on the billboard. The second you walk in for the exact kind of car and the color and every price range you're looking for is because you're influencing each other. Your conscious thinking mind is thinking, oh yeah, I want this car. Your subconscious mind is accessing the, that person's, so, uh, the information in the collective that that other person is looking to sell that particular car. So it matches the color of the car, uh, the price of the car, the type of the car, the location, you know, all, the, all these, vari the more variables, the more in sync it is with what you're looking for. So through something called the ideomotor effect, which is that the first Okay. The, the first thing to respond to subconscious stimuli is your nervous system. So when you get this gut response, oh, let me go to the store right now, and I see somebody pinning it on the board right at that very second, is because their subconscious mind knows that a buyer is available that influenced their subconscious mind, triggered them to want to go at that very moment to make that synchronicity happen. Do the idiomotor effect because your nervous system, that gut feeling that, oh, let me just go right now, make that happen is that they're influencing each other through that medium just like that so yeah synchronicity is uh, probably my favorite word because it just is relevant to so much of of my life i know a lot of people experience synchronicities the the things that i've experienced is uh beyond ridiculous the the frequency of them and the quantity of them that makes all this stuff happen and i consider these synchronicity machines 
you know, when you're resonating at this type of pressure and frequency with the ether, you are resonating with the ether. And, you know, uh, these affect consciousness. Synchronicities, um, I notice, happen more frequently with these, but there is also a radionic aspect to the MWO and some of these other devices. You know, that's not discussed on the website or anything like that, but um, I've been involved with different, I don't want to necessarily categorize it as radionics, but mind matter interactions and intentions and consciousness. There's technologies that can influence consciousness and all these kind of things could be grouped under the category of radionics. And I've been heavily involved with some of that stuff since about 2006 with um, kind of some self-help technologies and those kind of evolved and everything. But there is an aspect to this particular machine that um, I'm not going to identify to be able to help to increase the frequency of synchronicities um, by being around it. And and I, it. The whole field is magnified, so the intensity would, what I would think, would would affect the. But field. there is something specific, yeah. oh. engineered, in this system specifically to bring about an increase in synchronicities. Oh. And I don't. That's the first time I mentioned that ever. Uh, but that's been there basically since the beginning. Um, but these machines right now, you know, in, in this very moment on, and what is today? This is like October 7th or something. Yeah. Um, so we have a few units on the shelf, you know, for anybody that wants one right away. And we're building up uh, all the parts and getting everything fabricated for um, 20 more units. Those might be done by the end of uh, December. Uh, but if you want to learn more about the MWO, I've got a lot of videos and some ex, ex, uh, explanations on uh, vril.io, which is vril.io. And if you go on there, there's a products link in the main menu. And under products, there's a, uh, an RPX machine, which is a rife frequency generator invented by, uh, built by John Bedini, developed by John Bedini. And then there's the MWO link. So vril.io products, and then you'll see the MWO link. Um, and then all the information is right there. And, and you can fill out a form to receive uh, an updated price list and all the purchase documents and stuff. And then once you have those and look through that, if you have any questions, just email me at info at emediapress.com. And I answer all the emails personally, and I'll be happy to help you with whatever. That is awesome. You're doing such a great job. And I know these Thanks. are all handmade. Yeah. They absolutely are. Right, uh, just about all of it right here in the shop. Yeah. Too, yeah. So congratulations on all your amazing work and all the inventions and um, your journey. We and, celebrate and, your journey. And, and stay tuned that we, you know, I took this year off from doing the Energy Science and Technology Conference. It would have been the 13th one. And that was so I could focus on uh, product development um, you know, because of some family stuff and, and other other things going on in my life, it turned out to be a good decision because if there was a conference, I wouldn't have been able to help different people. And, you know, so that worked out good, but I haven't been able to put as much time into some of the new products that uh, I wanted. Uh, this is October, so if I can get a couple of these done by the end of the year, then I will look at planning, uh, most likely, uh, the 13th annual Energy Science and Te Technology Conference for 2025. Awesome. And it also depends on the global political situation if everything holds together because um, the whole world's like a madhouse right now. It so hopefully, is, but we're having the solar flares and it's predicted that with this, it's the hiccups with even the sunspots and the solar flares. It's crazy. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's... Too, too much going on. Yeah. Too many scary <laughs> too, things going on and a lot of, yeah. too many leaders are not caring about the people of the planet and and more about their interplay. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's crazy. But I think it's important with, um, you know, I would consider it survival technologies. You yeah. know, I think it's inevitable that anybody would be naive not to believe or see that there is an, an impending crash, you know, at various levels, you know, financially, whatever don't know how bad it's going to get but we haven't really seen anything yet but it is coming 
it's um, you know people need to be prepared uh, you know we're we've working on water purification technology uh, and there's a ha handful of other things and a priority is to be able to you know have these kind of things to be able to you know be useful in a world where you know of uh, uncertainty and if we can get some of these things out to the market great but if not then uh, you know at, at least we we have the know-how and stuff but um, I would encourage anybody to you know go to emediapress.com you know go through the catalog you can look at the conference by year there's you know 220 something uh, books and videos on there there's something for everybody there's a lot of free stuff you can download a lot of the panel discussions uh, got a little book about you know uh, the importance of uh, permaculture uh, there's some you know free book solar secrets it'll tell you the, the pros and cons to a lot of the different solar stuff that the solar industry won't tell you proper way to hook up batteries and that kind of stuff and these seem to be like simple things but no, nobody's t teaching the right way but so it's a wealth of it's a wealth of information you know it really is an investment to get your hands on some of this information and um, but are they categorized Aaron by year or also by topic both okay. and, and by presenter okay so they can find them, they find their topic any which way they want to yeah and and a lot of the previews are on um, YouTube you know um, even a lot of interviews and you know once in a while I'll do uh, uh, like a zoom call with Eric Dollard and you know Griffin Brock and the rest of the crew and you know do Q and question and answer sessions and and whatever and we'll cover updates of what we're doing and and so I have hundreds of videos on my YouTube channel. If you just go to YouTube and type in Aaron Murakami, you can find my channel. And the other go, question go and would be, a lot of your stuff that you do have is open source, so it's not like any, mm -hmm. it's not, most of the stuff is not hidden. There's very little proprietary stuff that we keep to ourselves. You know, um, the MWO, we have our own way of accomplishing Lakovsky's metho methodology. Yeah. But the book is out there if somebody wants to you know, hunt it down and build their own based on the specs and whatever. All these other things have been presented on, you know, the Tesla turbine, that's a priceless piece of technology where we have it for taking it further than anybody else. But Jeremiah presented on the principles and everything and anybody, if they want to try to tackle it on their own and do it, the information is there. It all has its genesis in Tesla's patents, which have been public domain for a century almost, you know. Um, so there's very there, there's very few secrets. Yeah, and I you say know, it's, just like anybody can start in their garage, and if something goes completely haywire, mm -hmm. at least people could look at the stuff and see it from a regional point of view, or how they mm -hmm. could actually start within their own region. And so when you're talking about you know any any kids or younger generation interested in this kind of stuff, if they're interested in the electricity and high voltage Tesla stuff and all this kind of thing, I would recommend getting a ham radio license your basic technician license, AARL, American Amateur Radio Relay League, or whatever it is, uh, you can get the manual on Amazon for 25 bucks or whatever, and you know, take a little test, pass your test, get your license, because that's like a mini crash course in electronics on how to tuning inductors, learning all the components, a lot of the basic stuff for you know radio frequency stuff, which um, all, all this stuff is perfectly in alignment with a lot of that conventional training and that's a good way for people to get their feet wet is yeah get their basic ham radio you know te technician license <laughs> um, it doesn't cost very much and that would see if I could do things over again when I met John Bedini I didn't know the difference between a transistor or a diode or you know and completely ignorant my learning curve took way longer I learned as I went and you know but uh, from the day I met John Bedini, I would have got my basic technician license because it would have taught me about a lot of this stuff, tuning coils for certain frequencies and all this kind of stuff. And you know, that's the audio bay right there, which is, um, you know, Eric Dollard engineered that. You know, we built that from scratch. You know, here, here at the shop, and a lot of that stuff is very, very advanced. But the point is, is if people just start there, they're going to learn a lot about. Um, a lot of this Tesla stuff because you can take a lot of that knowledge that you learn just to get that basic uh, technician license and you'll be able to understand a lot more when you know talking about resonator coils and tuning them and the capacitance and the inductance and all these kind of things very relevant 
and we need more people get, getting into that stuff. You know, also for disaster relief and whatever. You know, when the yeah. phone, cell phone network goes down and stuff, you're going to be needing shortwave radios and people that knows how to operate it and you know that kind of thing. And there's networks and there's clubs and they're low. The, yeah, and all, over all the, the place. Beaches. Yeah. Yeah, and these old ham radio guys, will you know, there's schedules to go in and sit down and take the test and yeah. buy twenty bucks and whatever and. And then, you know, a after that, get Eric's, you know, loan, uh, Common Language for Electrical Engineering, Lone Pine Writings, basic book that goes over the basic electrical terminology and straightens out, you know, a lot, lot of that kind of language. And, you know, there's a ton of video free videos on my YouTube page. I mean, hundreds, a lot of interviews. Um, you can see a lot of Eric Dollard's presentations and stuff. Um, if people are interested in, well, that's the electrical stuff. You know, I'm not. I wouldn't say somebody should not pursue an electrical engineering degree, because you you'll 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 learn a lot. You know, you'll be more proficient than somebody who doesn't have one. But then take a look at you know stuff that people are building, the John Bedini stuff, a lot of the machines you know, Peter Lindemann built, or you know Paul Babcock and stuff. And and there's plenty of patents and stuff too. You know, if you got a little bit of a background there, go look through those patents and, and try to replicate some of that stuff. But look at the videos where there's actual demonstrations and disclosures on what the circuits are and what they're doing and patent references and all that kind of stuff. All that stuff is out there, you know. Um, but there's a lot of categories of stuff people could get into. I mean, you know, there's if you're more interested in mechanical stuff, take a look at the Tesla turbine stuff. Jeremiah's put out a lot of videos. We've got presentations on our site. There's the Tesla patents. Um, that's more of a mechanical thing. Um, so if, if electronics and all that's not your forte and you're into, you know, machining and mechanics and working on engines and that kind of stuff, you might be interested in te Tesla turbine stuff. So, I mean, there's really something for everybody, you know, uh, if you're interested in, you know, agriculture. Okay, well, we, there's the permaculture stuff, you know, look up and start searching for electroculture. You know, I did an hour and a half, two hour presentation on electroculture year, years ago. It's a paid presentation, but you can find tons of free electroculture videos and old books from the early 1900s talking about how to use high voltage for plants and stuff like that. And then another resource is energeticforum.com. So I have energeticforum.com. That's, that's been around since about 2007 or six or whatever. And then there's energysciencefoam.com. Well, energysciencefoam.com was kind of like John Bedini's official forum, energeticforum.com. Eric Dollard has a ton of posts in there. John Bedini has, you know, tons of, you know, posts from him in there and Peter Lindemann and uh, that is a wealth of information. So if you go to energeticforum.com and or energysciencefoam.com, which is not as big, there's thousands of discussions in there and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of posts all throughout that forum. And it's not as active as it used to be. You know, if I get time sometime, I'd like to get more involved with it. But that is, uh, that's the leading forum on the internet with the best quality information. Uh, there's some forums out there that were pretty popular where it was just a mud slinging, slinging fest. Um, I never had a problem booting and banning people left and right because if they're acting up, causing problems or whatever, that's not what it's there for. If you're going to critique something, okay, critique it. But, you know, if you're acting like an idiot, you're, I'm going to ban you. And so I did. And so a lot of people would get banned from that forum and then they'd go, you know, bad talk me on other sites and stuff like that, but I never cared because, you know, I was more about maintaining the integrity as much as possible of as much, you know, uh, signal with the least amount of noise. You can only <laughs> do so much, but uh, th those are valuable uh, resources, you know. And then join Energy Times. So on emediapress.com forward slash Energy Times, that's, a, that's my free newsletter. There's maybe... I don't know, I, I have close to 110,000 subscribers to all my different newsletters and mailing lists and stuff. Energy Times is the biggest one. There'll be a pop-up on the forums and Energy Time or eMedia Press and everything. But if you don't see that, go to eMediaPress.com forward slash Energy Times. And that is where I put out most of the announcements, new products, new books we're publishing, different events going on, the conference stuff, when we're doing interviews or live Zoom calls and all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, check it out and, you know, spread the word. Yep. Awesome. Thank you.